Hello there, channel members, friends, and followers from around the world. This is Q8 Pilot, your host for tonight's show. And today, ladies and gentlemen, I have a special stream for you in which we are going to be taking a closer look at the Phoenix Airbus A320. And we're going to be flying today Volatia Flight 1375, a real uh, uh, route, real world route uh, service from Nice to Venice in Italy. Uh, our flight time today is very short, uh, but I hope I can uh, provide you with an instructive uh, stream today and show you all there is to see uh, in the Phoenix uh, A320. And I'm going to give you some thoughts uh, and some remarks on a uh, on the a Phoenix A320 versus the FS Labs and the Tolis as well. Um, what we're going to be doing today is uh, we are going to be going through all the steps uh, that are normally executed uh, with a real-world standard operating procedure from one of the major airliners. Um, for legal reasons, I am unable to say which um, airline is that. Uh, don't want to get in trouble, but <laughs> but uh, but yeah, it should be uh, should be fun. I hope you guys uh, find it useful. Uh, so we're gonna get started here. Uh, so the first thing uh, we're gonna first, I want to welcome all of you guys to the stream. So we have, uh, and I want to first welcome Opsley Jabads to the private pilot uh, here on the channel. Welcome aboard, my friend. Glad to have you here. Rand Coley, welcome aboard. I like Airbus. Stefanos, hi, my friend. How are you doing? Dougal Nektevish, hello, my friend. Welcome. Glad to have you here. We have uh, Antotti as well, and Adam. Welcome, guys. All right. So, <clears throat> in the life of a uh, of the pilot and the co-pilot and everybody on board, normally, what happens before the flight, uh, approximately an hour before the flight, is they all gather at the crew briefing room, and what they discuss it are four things. They discuss the uh, <clears throat> they will discuss the weather, the aircraft status, the no tams, and any possible threats. So those are the four things that happen in the crew, crew briefing room. And I'm going to bring up the uh, flight plan here real quick. <clears throat> and uh, very quickly, of course, they discuss a lot more things uh, than I'm going to show here, but for completeness sake, those are the four things that they discuss. And it's very important, I cannot stress enough the importance of checking the weather, uh, the aircraft status, no TAMs and threats. Now the weather, uh, the by the way, on your flight plan, in order to get the aircraft status, of course the weather will, we're gonna check in just a minute, but this here is the item you're gonna want to look at for the aircraft status. This is the minimum equipment list here and the configuration list as well. And it's a good thing that we don't see anything here because this is going to indicate that the aircraft is in tip-top shape, there are no problems with the aircraft and that we are good to go. Of course, our flight plan today out of Nice <clears throat> is going to be through runway 22 left through the BASP-7 X-ray departure, and we are going to be arriving into uh, into Venice, Italy, runway 22 left through the Albi 2 Echo Star. Uh, again, very, very important to check the weather, so I'm going to scroll down. Of course, they do all, they look at the routes, they look at the all the, uh, the fuel uh, here, so if we go back here, they'll look at their fuel and all that good stuff. So I'm going to go down here and I'm going to show you the NOTAMs. Now the NOTAMs are very, very important for pilots uh, because they contain very critical information about the arrival, uh, airport, the departure, the taxiways, if there are any inoperative uh, ILSs, uh, as, as you can see here, briefing to aid ILS runway 04, all of this is very, very important. But what is most important in the NOTAMs is this section here at the very end <coughs> let me go to it very quickly right here so the company NOTAM this is very very important that the pilots uh, discuss this and they are aware of the subjects uh, and whatever information is contained by the airline 
Brew Bulletin, this is again, suffice to say that this is something that you'll have to read and be familiar with uh, before the flight. Uh, and of course, any threats uh, that are uh, noted in the uh, in the flight plan. All right, now that we're let's let's begin with the fun stuff now that the uh, crew briefing is completed. And the very first thing we're going to do is we are going to head to the inside of the aircraft, and this is uh, basically the view here as we make our way to the cockpit. We're going to open the cockpit door and enter to the cockpit. Now, the first thing we're going to do in when we enter into a cold and dark uh, cockpit is to perform the pre preliminary safety check. <coughs> Excuse me. Welcome there, Pip. How are you doing, my friend? Welcome aboard. Lionheart, hello, my friend. Welcome aboard. Glad to have you here. And the uh, preliminary safety check is, uh, is as follows. The first thing we're going to make sure is the engine master switches are both in the off position. The engine mode selector is norm. Weather radar is off. Let me remove the handrest so you can see. <clears throat> Excuse me. So the weather radar is off, and then we're gonna take a look here at the landing gear, make sure the landing gear is down. We're gonna move up to the overhead panel and make sure the wipers are both in the off position. And then we're gonna move to the battery. I'm gonna move over to the overhead panel. Uh, let me see here. There we go. Uh, on the overhead panel, the only thing that you will see, even in a cold and dark Airbus, is the voltage of the battery and you want to make sure that you are reading more than 25.5 volts for battery one and battery two, which we do have. So this indicates that the batteries are in good condition. Now, of course, if that is below 25, then we better call maintenance. Uh, so you need to call maintenance in order to uh, uh, to, to get that uh, looked at. You can see the battery is already discharging and uh, this is something that is very well simulated in the uh, Phoenix. All right, so we're gonna, the next thing we're gonna do is we're gonna turn on battery one and battery two. So that's battery one and battery two. And we're gonna turn on the external power. All right, external power is on. And now the external power is supplying the aircraft with electrical power. Now, very quick uh, note on the external power versus the APU versus the engines. The Airbus has a priority, a priority in terms of the electrical supply. The external power is the one with the lowest priority. The APU has the second most priority and the engines have the highest priority. What this means is if you have the external power on and you turn on the APU and turn on the APU bleed, it will take the power off the external power, although it is on, and it will transfer it over to the APU. And then all the load is going to be on the APU. Once you turn on the engines, the generators, the engine generators would take over from the APU. So just remember the priority is from lowest to highest is external power, APU, and the engine gents. Hello there, Alex, welcome aboard. Stan, welcome aboard. Rafik Alberto, good evening to you, my friend. Welcome aboard. So that's the first note uh, for you in terms of the electrical power. Also, what's very, very important to note is when the external power is available and you have the APU turned on, do not turn on the APU bleed immediately. And normally this is done because the APU supplies two things. APU supplies conditioned air to the cabin and also electrical power. And if you don't turn the APU bleed on, what that means is that the APU is still going to blow cold air into the cabin but with the external power being on, that is going to consume less fuel. And this is something, of course, airlines are very particular about because to, to keep the cost down. So always when you turn on the APU, 
leave it, leave the APU bleed off until you are about ready to perform the before start checklist. And then, you know, we start the APU because it is required for the engines. All right. So we are done here with the uh, battery one, battery two, external power, and we've heard the three dings. Uh, so now what we need to do is we need to come here to the recall switch right down here, and we're gonna click and hold for about three seconds. All right, now we do have some issues here, as you can see. But these are okay, and this is simply because the aircraft systems are not operational yet. So we're going to clear that, and clear again, clear, and now we don't have anything here. All right, perfect. Once that is done, uh, the cockpit lights are as required. We're going to turn on maybe the overhead lights here. It's uh, starting to get uh, dark here in, in Nice, and next we are going to go to the engine page. Now from the engine page here, <clears throat> the only thing we need to check here is to make sure that we have more than 14 quarts of oil. And currently we have 20.8, so we are good. Next, we're going to go to the hydraulics page. And what I'd like you to remember with me here is we have three lines of hydraulics. So this is, you can think of this, if you're an electrical engineer, this would make a lot of sense. Uh, since you don't want to load everything on the same line. So they have green, blue, and yellow. What I'd like you to remember with me today is the yellow line controls the hydraulics for our brakes and for the cargo doors, uh, for the aft and uh, forward cargo doors. And just remember that, we'll get to that in a minute. Uh, we're just here making sure everything is okay and we are good here. And next we're gonna go to the pressure page and the only thing we want to check here is the display here says landing elevation auto that is uh, required <clears throat> and we are pretty much done with the pages here so we're going to go back to the status page right here all right and next we're going to go and make sure that our flaps are retracted and that the speed brake is disarmed which it is and finally, we are gonna check for all the equipment and that all the pitots, uh, pitot covers are removed uh, from the aircraft and uh, everything is uh, accounted for. The flashlights and all that good stuff is all accounted for. Now it's time for us now, by the way, the uh, flight sa preliminary safety check is now complete. And what we can do at this point is uh, is we can now perform the walk around. Now there are, we're not gonna perform the full walk around, but there are a few things I'd like to show you. Now, let me switch to the walk around mode and it looks funny. Now, one thing to know and is simulated very, very well, by the way, on the walk around, we're gonna begin with the captain's side. So let me just go here and turn around. All right, so the first thing we want to check, by the way, I'm not sure why in, during the walk around mound you see this black stuff there on the top, but that's okay. So we want to check all the, by the way, the walk around is a visual inspection. So there is nothing that the pilots actually do to the aircraft, but they check that the pitot covers are removed. Uh, this is very, very critical because you don't want, uh, so those will measure the airspeed against the airframe and also measure the angle of a attack. Uh, so those, it's very important that the pitot covers are removed. <clears throat> uh, not sure what's going on with my voice today. All right. Now, here's something I want to show you. You see this little open thing? This little um, intake is for the avionics condition, conditioned air. So this actually takes air and blows that air to keep the avionics cool. And you will only see this open when the outside temperature is more than 12 Celsius. The, uh, the other end, show, this is the intake and the outtake is on the other side. So this supplies the uh, avionics with cold air. And if we go to the aircraft, you can actually bypass this here. If you go to the ventilation, there is a blower extract and the calf bands. I'm gonna go ahead and click on the blower and this now will close everything in the aircraft, okay? 
So, uh, sorry, it will close the intakes. So if we go outside and look at the aircraft now, let me just go back out here. You will see that this little thing is now closed. Look at that. It's now closed. We've overridden this. Uh, of course, this is not advisable that we do this. So I'm just going to reopen it and go back to the outside. And uh, just remember, and by the way, cabin crew, uh, the ground crew normally like to stay on the other side during a cold day because it gives them warm air. So the cold air goes in here and out on the other side. So it's as you can see now, it's uh, open again. And we're just going to complete the visual inspection. Now, if you go to the engines, this is something not simulated. You will hear some tick, 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 tick noise normally on the on the aircraft. And this is very true. If you actually, uh, if you've ever been to an air to an Airbus uh, or any any aircraft, actually, you'll be able to hear this tick, 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 tick noise. And what it is is the blades are actually <clears throat> a little bit loose. So they are actually, uh, and and the reason why they're loose is when the engines start, they actually fall into position, unlock into position, and uh, and this is so so that's the ticking noise that you normally hear. We're going to go to the, uh, again, bottom of the aircraft, make sure there are no leaks and everything's looking good here. We're going to look at the second engine as well and make sure there are no debris and everything's looking good. Looks like a very healthy engine to me. We're going to, of course, look at the landing gear. Uh, again, we're going to make sure the tires are okay. And those are very, very expensive uh, tires, by the way. And uh, believe it or not, every time you hit the brakes, uh, it cost about 30 euros. Every time you hit the brakes, it cost 30 euros. Now, one thing that is not simulated on this uh, aircraft in terms of the visuals, by the way, the visuals are stunning on the Phoenix. But um, if you look, actually it is on this livery, on this specific livery. Now, let me show you this, uh, not on the main, uh, on the, uh, the default livery. You will see here that the nose wheel here has no black right you see this it's very very clean but if we go to the landing gear uh, here the main landing gear you'll see that the color is black the reason being that the front or the nose wheel does not have brakes and the brakes are only on the rear on the main landing gear and this is basically from the carbon that is uh, basically which comes out when hitting applying the brakes so that is the reason why you see the front being light, you know, because there is no carbon accumulation on the on the uh, uh, on their tires. Uh, but you can see it here very clearly, and that's just really all the carbon from hitting the brakes. All right, so that's what I wanted to share with you guys here on the walk around. We're going to hop back to the uh, cockpit now, <clears throat> and things are kind of getting dark so we'll illuminate the lights in a little bit uh, but we are now uh, done with the walk around and we're going to begin with the before start flow so first we're going to come here and we are going to uh, again bring the overhead panel all right all right first thing we're going to do is the cruise supply and this is again very important if you want to this is mainly for the oxygen supply and if you don't set this on, you will not be able to test the oxygen. So very, very important to make sure that the crew supply is done. Now, one thing noting, uh, one thing worth noting is this high out landing button. And you can see that this button is guarded. So it is not used in normal operation. And what this is designed for is for landing in um, airports that are that have an elevation of more than more than 14,000 feet. Uh, you will have, uh, you know, the landing elevation. You need to turn this on, and that that will prevent the masks from deploying. Um, also, ground control needs to go on. Oops. Okay, ground control is on, and. Uh, Basically, the reason why you need ground control on is that the airline wants to know everything that happens between the cabin crew or the pilot and the first uh, officer before the engines are started. And the flight data recorder is not uh, on when the engines are not, are not running. 
So uh, this will provide a recording of everything that happens prior to engine start. Uh, we need to test this, so click and hold. And you hear that beep uh, confirming that the uh, recorder is operational. Now the GPWS uh, system is uh, kind of self-explanatory. We know what this uh, does. It's like, like terrain, terrain, and all that good stuff. But there is also a landing flap three. And this is again, something not used in normal operations. But what a landing flap three is, uh, it gives you the ability to land the plane with flap three instead of uh, full flaps. Uh, the only thing you need to do is to turn this on to tell the um, aircraft computer that you are gonna land with flap three. And normally this is done to reduce noise and uh, also it consumes less fuel. The emergency electrical power, uh, again, this is a uh, bad day stuff. Uh, we can leave this alone. And the evac, uh, again, you can see it sometimes on captain, sometimes on purse or just captain. Now, the only thing that this means when it's on captain, where we're gonna set it, is that in case of an emergency, only the captain can initiate the evacuation procedure. The flight control here, all three here, this is for the aileron, spoilers, and the flight augmented computer. This has uh, got to do with the FADAC, and I will cover this with you guys in another stream. Uh, next, we're gonna go to the ADIRS. <coughs> And we're going to set the adheres. Now, the correct sequence to set the adheres is one, two, three. The first one here is the captain's side. This one is the first officer. And this is the standby IDRS or the uh, adheres. So now we're done with that. We're going to move all the way down to the control panel here where we have the lights. Now, of course, guys, uh, if you want me to provide you with this checklist, uh, I've already made a PDF um, of this document. I can nice it up and uh, give it to you. And I know I'm taking a little, a little bit of time because I want to really maximize the benefit of uh, giving you everything that I've learned uh, about the Airbus. So um, the next thing we're gonna do is the strobes go to auto and they remain on auto until uh, before we enter the runway. So this is gonna remain on, uh, on uh, auto and the nav lights go to the on position. All right, seat belt signs. Uh, we are already refueled, so we can actually turn this on, but I'll leave it off for now. And we're gonna go for the non-smoking signs. This needs to be on the auto position. Now, of course, smoking is prohibited and it has been for a very long time. When the non-smoking sign is on auto, the cabin crew will know when the landing is uh, landing gear is retracted or deployed because there is always a ding sound when this is set on auto. So it, when, when the landing gear is retracted, there is a ding that goes like that and cabin crew would know that they will be released soon because the landing gear is retracted. And of course, the emergency light uh, are uh, armed and then the fuel panel. All right, so one thing to note about the fuel panel. Now the aircraft is fueled, so we can actually go ahead and turn on all the uh, uh, fuel pumps. But again, I'm gonna assume that we are not yet ready to go uh, so that the aircraft is being refueled. When the aircraft is being refueled, what you need to do is turn on the left and right tanks only and leave the center tanks. Now, <clears throat> One thing to note about the fuel tanks is that the left and right tanks are located above uh, the engines, whereas the center tank is located below. So even when the aircraft is flying, if you turn off the left and right tanks, the fuel is gonna move to the engines uh, as a natural cause of gravity, whereas the center tanks will not. Of course, I'm not telling you to do that uh, mid-flight, but uh, that's something worth noting. And uh, as you can see here, we have the electrical power, uh, green, blue, and yellow, which we've discussed earlier. And so that is, uh, that is done for now. And uh, we're done with the fuel and we can now perform the um, APU fire test before we uh, turn on the APU. All right, so let me go ahead and do the APU fire test. 
and we're gonna look down here. Right. Excellent. And we can also perform the engine one and two fire test. Engine one. Engine two. All right, so all the tests are now complete. Excellent. Next, we are gonna go to uh, somewhere we don't normally visit in the, uh, in, in the Airbus cockpit, and you don't really need it that much, but it's something that's part of your safety checklist is this panel here, which is the engineer panel. Uh, you just need to make sure that there are no white lights uh, in the engineer panel, and if you do see any white lights, you need to call engineering to come and take a look at the aircraft. All right, perfect. Next, we are going to go to the standby uh, altimeter and the compass here and make sure there is no damage and they are operational, as we can see. And we can then go to the radio. And uh, here, let's go to the radio. Now, one thing to note about the radio is you have a standby nav here. All right, we're gonna set this, by the way, to passenger. We're gonna need this on and we're gonna leave it. Now, the standby nav, in case the Makdu doesn't work for any reason, you can come here, open the guard, click on nav, and now you can actually set the ILS frequency manually here. You can do the GLS, uh, ADF, all your uh, navigation, navigation, navigation <clears throat> instruments can be accessed and set uh, from the standby navigation device. Of course, we're not, not going to need it, hopefully, for this flight. So we're going to turn this off. And one thing to note also on the uh, on the channels here, you will be you will note that when you click on VHF two, VHF three, cabin, intercom, the light stays, with the exception of the passenger. If you click and remove, it will turn it off automatically. And this is actually done by design to ensure that when you know you don't accidentally leave this on and then you know you're talking with the first officer about you know your party last night and how much you had to drink and so your passengers won't hear that <laughs> so <coughs> so that's the reason why this is by design something that it does not hold like the other lights. I'm going to bring up uh, some lights here. It looks like it's uh, starting to get dark here. All right. So that is the uh, that's the radio on the first officer uh, on the captain's side. And next, we're going to go to the cockpit door. Make sure it's set on normal, which it is. And then we're going to go to the switching here. Now, this is very let me bring this uh, a little back here. All right. So if you look at the switching here, uh, this is where you can access all the, of course, you need to make sure that these are all in the norm position. And uh, all of these are self-explanatory to an extent, but with exception of the all button. Now, if you click on the all button, if you click, and as you can see, you will start cycling through the different items here. But if you click and hold, it will automatically cycle through all the pages, lead, pressure, electric, and so on and so forth. So we're just gonna leave it now where it is on the uh, door page. And we're gonna move on to the uh, thrust lever where I make sure it's an idle detent, which it is. And then we're gonna uh, make sure the parking brake is set, which it is. The alternate gear is stowed. And by the way, this is simulated on the Phoenix as you can hear, and it works pretty well. All right. And next, we're going to go to the uh, alternate, uh, the FO radio. We're going to set the same thing here, passenger. And then the transponder, we're going to make sure 2000 is dialed here and that it's on standby, standby, and altitude reporting is turned on. Now, one thing I want to show you guys here, which is very, very cool, and I was actually very surprised that Phoenix has, uh, Phoenix Simulation has actually uh, simulated this and uh, so let me go here and show you this you see this is the brakes accumulated pressure and the pressure in the brakes oh, what I'm gonna do is I'm going to release the brake and I'm gonna set them release 
So I'm just kind of playing with the with the brakes here. And you can see the accumulated pressure is going down. All right, so okay, we do have the uh, the chocks. And now we have an ECAM memo that says, uh, you know, we have a problem here because we don't have any pressure in the brakes. So if we actually remove the, uh, the chocks, you know what will happen? The aircraft will start moving because there isn't anything holding the aircraft. And the very cool thing is remember when we spoke at the beginning of the stream about the hydraulic system? Now, the hydraulic system, uh, the brake pressure is on the yellow hydraulic line. And the same goes for the cargo, uh, the car uh, aft cargo. So if I go now to the cargo here, I'm gonna go to the ground services. And if we look here, by the way, the bulk cargo is the only cargo door that is not connected to the aircraft hydraulics. This is a manual door that needs to be opened manually by cabin crew. I'm gonna turn on the aft car cargo. And what this will do is it will actually use the hydraulic system to initiate the accumulated pressure because it is on the same line as the, uh, it, is, it is on the yellow line, which is the same line as the brakes. So I'm gonna click on the forward cargo. This is going to open the cargo door, but look what's happened here. Yeah, it actually put the pressure back where it, but now we have full pressure on the brakes. And this is beautifully simulated by Phoenix, uh, which is very, very cool to see. All right, let's go ahead and close that. All right. Uh, we can close both the cargo door. Now you have the full, again, the accumulated pressure. All right, so uh, that is out of the way, and now we're gonna go to the McDo setup. All right, now on the McDo setup, the way it's done in real life, uh, here, let's go to here to the McDo, and today we're not gonna be using any of the, uh, we're not gonna be using the, um, you know, the SimBrief integration. We're gonna be doing everything manual to maximize Again, the benefit. And IFR Captain, hello, my friend. Sorry, guys, that I'm not really paying too much attention to the chat uh, because I really want to keep the flow going. Um, so in the McDo setup, there is actually a specific sequence. And by the way, I've always done this wrong. I've never followed the sequence until today. Uh, but there's a, a special sequence that is followed to set up the McDo, and it follows a sequence with abbreviation Diff's RIP, that's Delta India Foxtrot Sierra Romeo India Papa. Okay, Diff's RIP. Just remember Diff's RIP, and what it stands for is, let me go here. Stands for data, which is this. The I stands for Init Alpha, which is this one here, and then it's the flight plan. All right, that's the F, and then it's the secondary flight plan this one here, which is the S. Then it's the rad radio nav, which is the R. And then it is init Bravo, which is back here again. And finally, it's the performance. The P is for performance. So just remember diff strip, okay? Now, we are gonna check the data. We have the correct engine model here, the CFM 565 uh, Bravo 4 and the active uh, nav database uh, is uh, the latest uh, ARAC database. So we're gonna follow diff strip, data is complete. Next, we're gonna go to init A, init alpha, all right? We are flying today from Lima, Foxtrot, Mike, November, to Lima, India, Papa, Zulu, all right? And we're gonna, oops, we're gonna enter that here, all right? And the flight number today, we're gonna to bring up uh, our uh, friendly SimBrief plan. So let's fetch and let's go to the raw flight plan and note our flight plan here, which is VOE uh, or Volotea uh, flight 1375. So that's VOE 1375. And we entered that here. And the cost index for this flight is 46. All right, 46 is entered. And the final cruise altitude today is, uh, well, we can put 29,000 feet, that's fine. 290 and enter. All right, now one thing to note here, you see this, uh, by the way, let me just clear this here. 
All right. You see this minus 42? This is actually not the correct temperature. This is something that the McDo calculates. It thinks, it says, I think the temperature is going to be minus 42. But the correct temperature to put here is actually the average ESA temperature, which I'm showing zero, zero, zero. So we're just gonna put slash zero and put it here. And now you see that this is actually bigger in size, uh, meaning that it has been modified. And by the way, as a general rule in the McDo, anything that appears in this blue color, it means that you can modify it. That's something that you can modify. If it's in green, then it's something that you cannot modify. Okay. All right. Now the, we need to put the alternate airport. The alternate is Lima India Mike Charlie. So L I M C that's the alternate airport. Excellent. And everything here is done. So now we are done uh, from the diff strip sequence. We are done with the D we're done with the I and we're done with the um, F. <clears throat> Sorry, we're done with the D and the I. Now we're going to go to the F, which is the flight plan. Now, I've done this in multiple ways in the past, but the correct sequence is to enter the departure, the arrival, and then the in route waypoints. So that's exactly what we're going to do. We're going to select uh, the departure, and the departure today is going to be uh, from runway uh, 22 left. So that's two to left, and we are going to be departing through the BASP-7 X-ray. Uh, BASP, no, that's not the one. Cycle do BASP-7 X-ray. That's the one. All right, excellent. No transitions and insert. And next, we're going to go to the destination, which is uh, Venice. We're going to select the arrival. The arrival is going to be through runway uh, two to left. Okay, two to left. All right, let's see where it's actually. Uh, I'm seeing uh, two to left. Where's two to left? Ah, there we go. V O R two to left. Okay, that's fine. We'll select that. And the star is the LB two Echo. That's the one. Excellent. I was hoping we'd get an ILS today, but that's okay. Uh, so we're set to two left. All right, so insert. We'll check the weather later on and see. All right, so now we have the uh, we have the the departure and arrival, but we don't have the waypoints in between, so that's what we need to do. So we're going to go to BASIP. From BASIP, we're going to select the airways, and we're going to start with Yankee 15. Yankee 15. And then from Banky 15 uh, exit at Alpha Bravo November. And then uh, Mike 985. Mike 985. And exit at Oscar. Oscar. Excellent. That is correct, uh, Dougal. Uh, good evening, Mark. How are you doing? Uh, that is correct. The arrival is not known until we arrive. Uh, we'll, we'll change it later on. That's okay. No worries at all. Uh, we can select that. So, Oscar, um, uh, let's see. Uh, so, then it's Lima 615. Lima 615. And then we're going to exit at Albert. Albert. What did I do? Uh, Lima 615. Ah, Adosa. All right. Adosa is the correct one. All right. Brilliant. And then Lima 6112. Lima 612. And exit at uh, Albert. That's Albert. Okay. Right, Albert. Brilliant. And next, we are going to. to that's the arrival. So we're done here. So we're going to say insert. 
And now we're going to go to the arrival here and make sure there are no discontinuities in our flight plan. Looks like there is one discontinuity, and that is the end of the final transition into the star. So here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to clear that, and I'm going to clear the discontinuity. And now if we click here, now it should be okay. All right. So now if we click here, should be everything should look good. Let's go back to the transition. Yeah, all is looking good now, excellent. All right, so now we are done with the F. So uh, now we need to do the um, secondary flight plan. Now, normally um, the, the airlines would provide the pilots with the, uh, with the secondary plan. But for our purpose, we're just what normally they do on the ground is they just copy the active. So we're just going to copy the active. So that's the S in diff strip. And next, we're going to go to radi radio navigation. Now, normally in this page, um, everything is set uh, automatically. And I'm wondering why we haven't gotten the uh, why we haven't gotten the ILS here in the radio. Maybe it takes a little bit of time. But it has the VOR, it has all of that. Maybe there is no ILS for the uh, departing runway. And that's the reason why you don't see it. If we select for right, uh, then you'll get this tuned here. Now is a good time for me to show you the flight plan uh, here. So if we, go to, um, if we go to our airport, so this is our departure, all right? And uh, there are no visual uh, additional visual aids that we can enter but normally if you have uh, something like an ADF uh, or a VOR station along this path uh, in your departure you would add it uh, in the uh, here so you'd add it either on the ADF or the uh, you already have a VOR frequency set so you'll add any additional aids to guide you through the departure for situation awareness in our case there isn't anything there so we're just going to skip that and now we can go to the init B. All right, so init Bravo is actually this page here where we enter the zero fuel and the zero fuel center of gravity. Okay, perfect. So for this information, it's starting to get really dark here. So maybe I'll change the time uh, just so that we can enjoy the, uh, you know, enjoy the beautiful terrain uh, over at Venice, but uh, that's okay. Uh, let's go ahead here now and go to the mass and balance. All right, and the mass from the mass and balance here. Let me let me go ahead and change the time here a bit. Uh, so we'll put just put it here. Yeah, that's fine. All right. So if we look here at the mass and balance, we have 50, uh, 57.66. So 57. Point, oops, 57.66, and slash the uh, CG, which is 30.9. Now, this is very important, guys, 30.9, 30.9. All right, so what I have been doing for uh, many, many years is I go and select this up and down for the trim. And actually, that is not what the pilots do in real life uh, on the Airbus. What they actually do is let me let me go ahead and enter the block fuel, which is 6.3. Uh, we're just going to round it up 6.3. All right, so that's block fuel. All right, so this number actually represents the trim that we're gonna set here. And if you look here on the trim, you'll see the numbers 10.5, 20, 25, 30. We have 30.9, which is about 31. So we're gonna move the wheel. We can't move it now because the uh, hydraulic system is not on yet, but we're gonna move it so that this little white triangle points to 31 here on the trim there is nothing that you need to set in the up and down or anything like that on the performance page this is the number that you need to set on your trim wheel okay all right so that is now done now another thing we need to do is we need to enter the alternate uh fuel by the way you when you go to the initial fuel prediction page the, one of the things you have to check is that on arrival you have 30 minutes left and minimum 30 minutes, that's a legal requirement. So you have to have 30 minutes. And so we're gonna put the alternate here, which is 1.8. So 1.8 for the alternate. <clears throat> All 
All right, so that's set. And uh, everything else here is uh, is looking good on the uh, initial page. Ah, one, one thing that's very important is the trip wind. Now, if we look here on the trip wind, <coughs> you will see that... Uh, all right, so we'll see here on the average WC, we have P12, that's positive, okay? If this was minus, if this was M, then it would be headwind, so we'd enter HD and the number here that we see here. But since we see P, it means positive, which means that this is a tailwind. So we are gonna enter the tailwind, which is TL, and then whatever we see here, which is 012, 012, that's for the tailwind there we go and now we are done with the uh, in it B page and now we can go from the diff strip so we've done the uh, we've done everything up to in it B or in it Bravo and now we need to go to performance all right so we're going to go to the performance page now and we are going to for this use the uh, use the Airbus uh, the electronic flight back here to do the uh, performance and sync the load sheet we're going to do packs on for departure sync the live weather and we're going to calculate and that is going to give us uh, 138 140 141 138 140 and 141 all right excellent and transition up to 5,000 and we all the only thing we need to put now here is flaps one we don't need to put uh, the other stuff and flex temperature is 63 degrees all right next we need to go to the progress page so now we're done with the performance but we need to go to the progress page and check two things okay so first we are going to check the GPS primary here and we're gonna make sure that accuracy here says high okay so those two things make sure that you have them before you leave this page and the next thing we need to update the uh, the uh, the runway so we need to put the runway here in case there is an emergency and we need to return back to the airport so I'm going to enter LFMN and then it's gonna be 2 to right two to right uh, so we depart from two to left but the arrival always is on the opposite runway so we're just going to put that here and it's going to give you the bearing and distance to the runway obviously it's 0.5 because we are here at the airport and now we are pretty much done with the mcdo the mcdo is now properly set up and we can the uh, for the captain will always keep the performance page and the first officer will always keep the flight plan page uh, on the display. And that's exactly what we're gonna do. We have this here. And now we can go and begin with the before start flow. So let me remove this flight plan here. All right, so seatbelt signs are on. All right, and the central tanks can go to the on position as well. All right, uh, and now it's a good time to start the APU. All right, so let me head over here and say APU master. We're going to wait three seconds, 1001, 1002, 1003, and start the APU. Excellent. All right, now that we have the APU, we can test the oxygen. And to do this, we can open this here, and this is simulated uh, again by Phoenix Simulation. You want to see this light here coming, indicating that the oxygen that you have the oxygen this comes from the crew supply button that we've uh, turned that's the only thing we need to do here with the uh with the oxygen test now we're going to go to the glare shield and sets the uh set stuff all right so first of all let's go ahead and use the b button we're going to set the altimeter to 1014 next on the EFIS, this is called the official name for this is the EFIS control panel we're gonna set CSTR, which uh, actually means constraints. And uh, if we change this here, you'll, you'll be able to see all the speed constraints, everything here. Uh, if we go to the flight plan, uh, let me see here if we go. You should be able to see all the constraints 
uh, in here. I'm not sure why we're not getting them now, but uh, but yeah, all the constraints will be displayed here, waypoint and the constraints. Maybe there aren't any constraints right now. All right, so that's okay. All right, so this needs to be set on the constraints. Speed we leave alone, heading we leave alone, and then we're gonna set the altitude to 29,000 feet. Hey there, some aviation. How are you doing, my friend? <coughs> All right, we're going to set this to 29,000. All right, 29,000 is now set. Excellent. All right, and uh, we're pretty much done here with the MCP altitude. All right, we're going to leave the terrain on the uh, captain's side and the weather on the first officer's side. We can actually turn this on now if we want. And then the uh, HP bleed can come on. Right, we're going to turn on the APU bleed, and we're going to turn off the external power. Right, excellent. And now we can actually do the before start checklist. But before we do so, there is a few things I want to show you guys here. So, ah, right here. All right, so I've been asked uh, in the past uh, about two things, uh, the rain repellent. Um, and the engine manual start. Now, the engine manual start it n is normally not used in normal operations on Airbuses fitted with the CFM engine. However, uh, the I IAE engines, uh, if the tailwind is more than 10 knots, uh, then it is a requirement that all Airbuses with an IAE engine uh, st use the manual start to start the engines. So it is only it is not required if the tailwind is less than 10 knots. And by the way, even if the t uh, tailwind is more than 10 knots, even if you're at the gate, you're still required to use the manual uh, engine start uh, with the IAE engines. The rain repellent is, uh, is actually a chemical uh, that is used in extreme rain uh, though airliners, for the most part, recommend against using it for two reasons. Uh, by the way, it's very, very effective, so it does work as it should. But uh, most airliners recommend against using it simply because um, uh, it's not environment friendly. This is very, very toxic. And the other thing, if it's used, uh, if it's improperly used, then it, it will cause, you know, spots and stains on the windshield. And uh, this is a very, very expensive uh, piece uh, there, so you don't want that to happen. So now we are done with the uh, with everything here, and uh, yeah, all is good. So we're gonna go with the before start checklist. Cockpit preparation completed. Signs on and auto. Adiers. Now the adiers, if you want to check the. Uh, uh, the ideas you can go to the uh, let's see here on the progress page and then go to the let's see progress page and then go to uh, all right let me figure this out real quick door page. I forgot where it is. Let me go here real quick. All right, so this is the progress page. Uh, performance, no. I totally forgot, totally skipped my head. You need to check that the nav um, that the adheres are set to nav, nav, nav. Uh, so I'm, I can't recall where you go to check this. Is it here? No. I can't really recall, uh, but I'll check on that. Hey, Bill Barrett, how are you doing, my friend? Click the data button. All right, uh, data button. All right, there we go. All right, position monitor. There we go. All right, so nav, nav, nav. All right. Now, one thing to note here, thank you guys, appreciate it. Uh, you see here it says zero, zero, and zero. If 
when you go to the init page, remember I used to always go iris init and confirm alignment. When you do this, it will actually not align the iris to the exact position. It will just be something in the vicinity. But in order to do this properly, you just leave it and it will automatically, uh, it automatically do that for you. And now you want to, when you see zero, zero, it means that the iris is now aligned to the exact position of the aircraft. All right, so we're done with the uh, ideas. Fuel quantity, uh, we're gonna go to the fuel page here and you wanna make sure that you have 3140, 3140 balanced. So the total is 6280 kilogram and you would say 6280 balanced, okay? And then we are gonna go to the FMGS, which is set, altimeter is, uh, Altimeter is 1014, 1014, 14 feet. Okay, all right, we are done with the before start checklist. And now we can move to the before start checklist to the line. And this is when we actually get clearance from the tower uh, to clear us uh, for departure. So everything here is good. So we are going to uh, turn on the beacon lights. All right, so beacon is on. And now we can uh, basically uh, get uh, GSX to push us out of our position. We got the clearance. So we're gonna say prepare for pushback and departure. All right, perfect. Departure clearance is uh, requested and we are good. All right. So now we can go and perform the before start checklist down to the line. Windows and doors closed, beacon on, mobile phone off, parking brake is on, and the clock start uh, is something we need to do after. By the way, the before uh, start checklist to the line is completed. Now we can go to this clock here and start it. All right, run the clock. And now we'll wait for the clearance to start our engines. Oh, they have a new checklist. Well, I think the checklist will differ, uh, Jose. Thank you very much for that. But I think each airline is gonna have different procedures. Uh, and the specific airline that I've used to create this is, uh, is using this procedure until very recently. So, uh, all right. So I think we're gonna do facing Southwest T and waiting for your actions to dismiss GPU. Okay, so let me come down here to the electronic flight bag and we're gonna go to the ground equipment and ground services and GPU off. The chocks and cones are off. All right, they're locking the gear now. Excellent. Right, we're gonna put constraints on the first officer side as well. And we're gonna set this to 10 in terms of the range. All right, perfect. Alright, let's release the parking brake. Alright, we have clearance to start our engines, so the engine mode selector goes to ignition start, and we're going to begin with engine number two. By the way, you, you remember we saw all X's, and now you can see the numbers. The reason being for that is that the FADEC system is not on until you turn the engine mode selector to ignition start. And that's when the FADEC system kicks in and obviously is now operational. All right. Engine one is now starting. By the way, this uh, airport is the default uh, airport, hand handcrafted airport by a Sobo. And it looks like the aircraft are changing their departure 
Maybe this is an arriving aircraft. All right. All right, looks like we have a good start here on the engine number two. All right, avail. And now we can go for engine number one. I hope you guys are enjoying this stream. And uh, I thought engine one first, then start in there. No, it's actually engine two, then engine number one. You can do single engine taxi yeah, if you want. It depends again on your airlines. Some airlines do not actually permit it, but you can do that, yes. All right, in position set, parking brake. Parking brake is set. All right, and let's go ahead and confirm a good engine start. Cockpit to ground. We have a good engine start. You can disconnect. All right, we might get that uh, brakes hot uh, again with GSX, but that's okay. All right, second engine is now available as well. Now, one thing you want to check uh, with the Airbus to make sure everything is okay is you want to check 2N1. So just remember this sequence, guys, when you start the engines, 2, 4, 6, 3. So this one is close to 2, uh, and like 20, so number 2. And then this is close to number 4. This is close to 6, and this is close to 3. So that's how you know that all your, uh, all the readings here are, uh, you know, are correct, or are that the aircraft status is is worthy, uh, flight flight worthy. All right. So the next thing we're gonna do here, the after start flows, is we're gonna turn on the engine mode selector to the norm position, and then we're gonna go up here and turn the APU bleed off. Next, we are going to. Uh, set the APU master to off and then we're going to reset uh, arm the spoiler Right, so we're going to come here arm the spoiler and Then reset the rudder trim very important. All right, so let me reset now. Let me tell you what this is guys This is by the way. It is The most airlines in their operating procedures They recommend not to play with this and to always reset it but what this is used for the Tear and wear on the tires on the Airbus is never going to be even. So sometimes you'll have more wear and tear on the left or the right landing gears. Uh, and the rudder trim here is actually used to get the aircraft to taxi in a straight line. And if it doesn't go in a straight line with the rudder trim being zero, you can adjust this until, uh, you know, until it goes in a straight line and this will measure the wear and tear of the tires and on which side but for takeoff it has to be reset to zero so we're going to reset that to zero we're going to set flaps one all right now there's an interesting thing about the flaps that i again i never knew about <clears throat> so let's go here you can see the slats looks like there's an aircraft on top of us <laughs> but uh yeah for some reason i'm not sure why but you'll see that, uh, let me see if I can show you on the other side. Yeah, all right, so you can see the flaps being deployed here with flaps one and the slats. However, when you're up in the air, the flaps one position actually does not deploy the flaps. It only deploy the spoilers. And that's very, very interesting. Uh, <clears throat> uh, I'm not a pilot just going off what V1 says. Uh, again, some things will differ, guys. It depends on the airline that he flies for uh, and uh, and the, the one that I've done this uh, based on their SOPs. So there will be some differences, but that's okay. All right? So that actually is uh, something that differs uh, in on the ground and up in the air. So <clears throat> now we've set the flaps, and now we're just going to go to the status page. By the way, the takeoff config, we have the auto brake, so we're going to set the... Uh, we, we, we'll do it before the before taxi flow, but uh, we can now go to the status page here. All right, and we can see that it's normal. 
and now we can do the after start checklist anti-ice as required ecam status checked pitch trim 30.1 we need they forgot to set that again very good that we have the you know the checklist now so we can check so we're going to set this to 30.1 let me just zoom in so you guys can see it right uh, 30.1 I think that's about right all right perfect 30.1 is set uh, rudder trim zero okay so rudder trim this is this is the rudder trim and it's zero and the after start checklist is now complete now for the before taxi flow there are a few things that we need to do and first we're gonna go to uh, the flight control check now there is something very interesting about the flight control check and uh, this is the flight control check all right so what I want to show you guys is a couple of things now when we go full up you see that this pitch trim here goes all the way to the you know all the way to the end here and this is full up full down full left when you go full left do you see how this doesn't go all the way to the top this is actually very accurately modeled the reason being is let me show you if let me see if I can show you this uh, I'm not sure if it's modeled on the uh, let's see here all right you see this part here you see how it's actually kind of a little bit down and that's the reason why it doesn't go all the way up in the display in the cockpit here and the same thing is gonna happen for let me show you here again so if you go up here you see that by the way, if we retract the flaps, it will go. You will see it, and the same thing happens here. All right, so that's the flight control check. We're gonna do the pedal uh, as well. Pedal full left, full right, and neutral. Again, brilliant, brilliant simulation uh, from Phoenix Simulation on this aircraft. Very, very good. Thanks very much, Carl, for the uh, info there. Very good. All right. So 31% uh, is uh, set now. And uh, all right, so the before taxi flow, the flight control check is done. Auto brake is set to max. The weather radar is on. So we're gonna turn this on here, on, and we'll put it on system one. The engine mode selector is normal. Transponder, now the transponder goes from standby to auto, all right. And that is pretty much uh, everything we need to do. All right, so now we can do the before takeoff checklist to the line. And I'm gonna go ahead and say, click here, takeoff config is normal. And now we can do the before takeoff checklist to the line. Flight controls, checked. Briefing, completed. Flap settings, config one. And that's, by the way, how it is set. You don't say config one, you have to say config one one that's the way it's set fma and takeoff data 140 138 blue 141 magenta climb blue uh, climb nav blue 1 fd2 290 blue and uh, finally uh, flex 68 okay now one thing I want to also tell you guys here, uh, now I've set this to 29,000, which is our final cruise altitude for the flight, but the correct altitude that you dial in before you get clearance from ATC is this here. You see on your departure chart, you see the initial climb clearance, say jets, flight level 100, which is 10,000 feet, and for the props is flight level 070. So with before ATC actually gives us, let me set this to uh, 10,000 feet, all right? I'm gonna set this to 10,000, all right? So 10,000 feet is set and, uh, and cross-checked, yeah. All right, so 10,000 is set, and that is the initial clearance you, the, you need to get from your chart. And, and so we've done that now, and we have the, uh, we can do the before takeoff checklist to the line, flight controls checked, Briefing completed, flap settings config 1, FMA and takeoff data 138 blue, 141 magenta, climb nav blue, 1 FD2, 10,000 blue, 
flex 50, uh, 68. Transponder is set ECAM memo, takeoff no blue, and the before takeoff checklist to the line is complete. And now we can taxi. We're going to turn on the taxi light. Now, here's the thing about the lights again. Uh, we're going to go here and all right. So the wing lights, you never actually the wing lights will illuminate the wings. And this is something just kind of show the passengers at night. I used to turn them on and this is incorrect. So you don't turn this on at all. The nav light, different airlines use different procedures, but normally the normal use of the nav lights one and two, they have to be on by the way. But if the pilot flying is the captain on the left side, you keep this on nav one. And if it is the first officer flying, uh, the, cap the, the, uh, the pilot flying, it would be on nav two. I'm today the uh, pilot flying uh, and I'm in the captain's seat. So we'll leave this on the nav one and then we're gonna go for the taxi lights. That's the only light you need uh, right now for the taxi. The runway turnoff light is only turned on as we enter the runway and it is turned off as soon as we exit the runway as well. Obviously the landing lights will only be turned on once we are um, uh, at the runway. All right, so we are good now and we can taxi to the runway runway two to left for the uh, for the departure so parking brake is released and let's go we'll give it a little power here and uh, any any speed between uh, up to 30 knots uh, or 20 knots on the ground is okay right let's go Very nice livery. I'll be home for dinner. Yay! <laughs> All right. Our speed is good and we are looking good now this clock here um, by the way we can this this clock only has minutes so we can turn this is something if you want to use it as a timer for something when you know you're expecting something uh, you can use this uh, as a timer this is the current clock uh, UTC and this is a clock that you can start as soon as you uh, turn on the engines and this is different from the chrono clock okay so this chrono clock you will start once you enter the runway and you're ready to go All right there we go and that is uh, runway two to left right there so we're gonna cross the runway here and by the way when you cross the runway you have to turn your strobes on okay so we're good there By the way, in another stream, I will go through the entire FMA, and there's a lot to learn, by the way, uh, again, on the Airbus. So we only barely scratched the surface there today. So there's a lot more coming, and uh, I plan on bringing uh, many series uh, on the Phoenix uh, uh, in, the, in the days to come. So, uh, or the Airbus, uh, but we're going to be using the Phoenix because I think the simulation is just wow. Really. I mean, some of the things I was blown away that they've actually simulated, one of which was the, you know, brake pressure there that, uh, as, as I've shown you there, it's just amazing. It's really, really amazing. All right, here we go. Let's make the turn here.
All right, we're gonna cross the runway, so we're gonna make sure there are no incoming flights. Left and right is clear. Oops. <laughs> All right, and we're gonna make a final stop there and do the... All right, we're good here. So we need to turn on the strobes on to cross the runway. All right, and this is the entry point and you need to stop the aircraft where you can actually still see the line. So we're gonna stop here, All right? And we're gonna set our parking brake and we can turn off the strobe momentarily. All right, let's go through our checklist now and flow. So the before takeoff checklist uh, below the line is quite simple. So cabin is secure for takeoff. Uh, engine mode selector is by the way let's remove that all right so the engine mode selector is normal TCAS is set to TARA all right excellent and by the way uh, just one thing here uh, let me explain something here uh, which is very cool I again I didn't know about normally um, You'll see this put on all so that pilots do not forget. All will give you uh, just about all the information that you need and for, for a TCAS. By the way, we can put, just put something here. Uh, but normally, actually, when, when you're taking off, you need to put this on above because that is going to give you more accurate information on everything that is above you in terms of traffic. Once you are at your cruise altitude, you actually switch this to below because it's going to give you more accurate information about everything that's below you. Uh, but we're going to just leave it on all for this, uh, for this flight. All right, so we are good here and we are ready to, uh, to go. And we're going to do the, um, the before takeoff checklist uh, to the line. Cabin, secure for takeoff. Engine mode selector is normal. TCAS, TARA, anti-ice, not required and lights to take off. And now we turn on the runway turn off lights and we put the nose light to take off. No need for the wing lights. All right, we're good to go. Parking brake is released. Now, when you, when you enter the runway and we set the power to 50%, and normally it says, you know, there's, there's a lot of things that are normally cold by the F. And so when the FMA starts displaying things, by the way, when you see a white box uh, here in the FMA, it means things, something has changed. And the FMA is just trying to tell you that this has changed. So pay attention to it, uh, which is very, very cool. I'm, I'm going to remove the ND so just we can see here uh, what's happening. Uh, I'm not sure why we're not getting the restrictions there. All right, so that's two to left. And what we're going to do is we're going to turn a little to the left and take it from the beginning of the runway, their by waste runway. So yeah, let's uh, let's do that. And so the FMA is going to give you all the information here. And normally, what you hear the pilots saying is they actually read the FMA. They read whatever they see here once they put the thrust uh, on uh, takeoff thrust. Uh, so let's go ahead and make the turn now. All right, that's two to left. All right, perfect. We are lined up. And now the only thing we need to do is we set the chrono. And we're going to go to, we are cleared for takeoff, runway two to left. We're going to take this to 50% of N1. First click, second click. Oops, there we go, come on. There we go, Manflex 63 SRS. Now, we're not getting runway here, and that is uh, probably either, by the way, SRS is the speed reference system. It takes care of the vertical, uh, uh, the vertical control of the aircraft, and the runway is the lateral movement. Uh, so that's V1, and rotate. You see this box here, Manflex, the box that has changed. And now we are going to maintain 17.5 degree pitch. You can see now climb is in blue, which means that it's armed. You see nav here as well, 
with the box, it means it is armed. Uh, I'll, I'll cover the FMA in another stream. Uh, we're going to take a detailed look at the FMA in, a, in, a, in our stream. Now, let's begin our turn. Now, the SRS, what... Let me, let me just go ahead here and let me, let's just wait for the... Uh, and then we'll explain things. All right, so let's see here. Right, and we're gonna set thrust climb is set. You can see again the two boxes here. Autopilot one is engaged, and you can see again the white boxes here in the FMA indicating autopilot one is engaged. Auto throttle. It shows the box for a few seconds, and then it goes. And now we are taking off. Uh, we are climbing. All right, excellent. And now I'm going to retract the flaps. Now, when we retract the flaps, what? Well, by the way, you know what? Let me let me bring the flaps back on. Okay. What you'll notice is there are no restrictions here, so yeah, it'll probably just go. All right. So let me just show you one. Um, yeah. Well, maybe I'll show you on landing that when you actually select flaps one, it doesn't actually uh, deploy the flaps it only deploys the spoilers when you are on the ground okay so we've retracted the flaps uh, we are going to uh, 250 knots that's the first constraint uh, that I'm not sure why we're not seeing the constraint today uh, normally you'll see all the constraints here but I'm not sure why we're not getting them we should be all right so and we're gonna also change the uh, the altitude here so we've been cleared by ATC for our final cruise altitude which is 29,000 feet so let's set that and now we're good all right so now we can do the after takeoff uh, checklist flaps retracted speed brake disarmed exterior lights runway turn off and taxi lights can go off cabin crew we can release and to release the cabin crew you cycle the seatbelt sign here, and so now the cabin crew uh, are released. You can set this here now to, all right. So at 10,000 feet, we're gonna set this now to airport. Yeah, I'm not getting, uh, there's something, something is definitely not right here. All right, transition altitude. Arrow set to standard on both sides. All right, perfect. We continue our climb. Ah, landing gear is... That's my bad. Thank you, Carl. Yeah, I was... Uh... <laughs> I was, uh, you know, I, I got carried away with explaining things about the FMA. That's why it's a good idea. There's just so much a rush of information in my head that I just want to give it to you guys. So, uh, yeah, hence the, uh, the little uh, snafu. All right. So we continue our climb now. Uh, through to uh, 29,000 feet. Everything's looking good. You can see the aircraft you can see now this is in green which means that it is active and anything that you see in blue so if we look here anything in blue it means that is armed okay armed but not active yet and alt is when we reach the final cruise which is 29,000 feet is going to be where this is going to turn into green which means that it is now active nice departure by the way from uh very nice departure from uh, from Nice. All right, we're at ten thousand feet. We're going to turn off the landing lights, and also what you do at ten thousand feet is uh, you clear any nav IDs that you've done, 
here. So if you go, if you've entered here anything, you need to clear that. Uh, so let me ch just put this here back. So we're back in climb. And also what is done is uh, the EFIS is on airport. And another thing that is done by the airlines is you go to the init page and now you set the cost index to zero. And this is mainly done to save on fuel. Now, if you notice here, UTC 1729, if I set this to zero, so zero and here, and now you can see that this is actually changed to 1733. So it's actually going to take a little more time, but it's gonna save us some fuel. And that's what the airlines do normally at 10,000 feet, just to uh, save fuel. Uh, maybe in another day I will explain to you guys the, uh, uh, you know, I'll explain to you the um, the cost index uh, and what it means and how it's done. Yeah, let's go ahead and uh, release the passengers. Fasten seatbelt signs is off, and uh, off we go now to our cruise altitude. All right. I hope you guys are enjoying. Constraint button is not selected. Maybe that is why you don't. No, no. Uh, so it was selected earlier, uh, but uh, uh, at 10,000 feet, you need to go to airport. It was selected earlier, but it wasn't. Uh, things were not showing here for some reason. I don't know why. It's the first time I don't see it in just about all the flights that I've done. It was definitely there, but it could be a glitch. And uh, yeah, it might be a glitch. I don't know. All right, we can go to the status page. Here we can see everything is normal. And by the way, if you go to recall and click on recall, there you can see it here as well. It says normal. All right, perfect. All right, there's one more button I think I missed. I want to tell you guys about. You see this button here in the cabin pressure, right? You see this button here, ditching? All right, so what this button is, is it will close all the aircraft valves, all the air conditioning routes, the ducts, everything will be completely shut down. And this will prevent, and ditching it says ditching, and this will prevent the aircraft from drowning in case of a landing on water. And for the reason, for this very reason, the, uh, the US air flight by Captain uh, Chesley Sellenberger has actually drowned very quickly. The reason why he did not click this button. And uh, after the incident, they actually reviewed the checklist uh, procedures for the airlines and they found that this was like item 25 or 35 on the checklist for ditching. And the, uh, since then, all the aircraft manuals have been revised to make this uh, one of the very first items to do when you actually do a water, uh, landing on water. Uh, so this actually is a very useful button if you know you survive the uh, the landing on water, and that's why, by the way, the button is uh, is guarded because you don't want to click that, uh, you know, while you're in flight. So that's what this button does, and I will continue with this series to bring to you, you know, what these buttons do, uh, you know, those the ones at least the ones that we don't normally use and we just kind of skip through them. They actually do serve uh, some very important. Uh, you know purposes uh, on board the Airbus I tell you guys I have found that going through the checklist and going through the proper procedures to be a very enjoyable thing uh, hit the CSDR no so no so all right so guys the CSDR button is clicked as part of the cockpit preparation and it is only clicked back again as part of the McDo preparation for arrival. All right, so that's the sequence that at least used by the procedure. Um, uh, that is used during the icing procedure as well. That's correct, yeah. All right, so guys, uh, if you click on CSTR, you get nothing, all right? There is nothing here, all right? But this is not the correct procedure after you pass 10,000 feet. You switch this to airport. That's the correct procedure according to the airline that I am using. All right. So then when uh, when we do the Mokdu preparation, the first thing you'll actually do for the approach preparation is you set this back to the constraint and hopefully we'll see them 
once we are there. But right now, we're, we're getting absolutely zilch. We're not getting anything. It's got to be a bug. Yeah, Carl, correct. The Again, uh, Dougal, I think a lot of the things that I do here is... Uh, is going to differ from airline to airline. So, uh, so yeah, I, I mean, looks like there's some sort of a bug though, because in the previous test flights that I've done, when you click uh, constraint, you get everything here. You see all the speeds, the altitudes. It actually looks pretty cool. So, uh, so yeah. All right, now we can enjoy some coffee in the cabin. And let's take a look here at some wing views here. Lovely. That is a nice view. Um, so basically, when I started using the, uh, uh, for sure, SOPs are things that deviate from manufacturer system operating checklist items, things you can do differently that do not degrade safety or performance. That is correct, yeah. Were there any actual constraints on this departure? Uh, I don't know. I don't think so. Uh, we can see here, no, there were no constraints, it looks like. So it was fine. Let's take a look at our uh, arrival into... Uh, all right, so here there is definitely uh, constraints. So, yeah, so definitely maximum. Okay, so a good test will be at our arrival into... Uh, into uh, Venice because there are a lot of restrictions here so we'll be able to see that once we are there once we are at our uh, destination uh, through the Albert 2 Echo uh, arrival uh, today all right if we also uh, by the way it looks like the weather has changed so we should have taken runway uh, 04 right uh, from uh, uh, from uh, from Nice but that's okay it could have happened after our uh, after, uh, after departure but still, we have the uh, favoring winds uh, for runway 22 left at, uh, at Venice. So we'll just stick to the original plan. All right, we're almost at our top of climb. Uh, thrust climb. Uh, we'll see things again changing here in the FMA. And it's, it's, it's really very... You can see this clock now. We're about 35 minutes from the minute we started our engines but 13 minutes into our flight, right? So I tell you guys, following, um, following the SOP and following the proper procedures is uh, something that I really, really enjoyed. And uh, it really gives, um, it just really gives a different experience. Now you can see guys here, the FMA is changing with the white boxes, Mach speed is active. So it's telling you now I'm going from speed to Mach and the altitude is I'm reaching the maximum altitude. So alt cruise is now active, uh, where it used to be armed. Now you see the box again. It's telling you something has changed. I went from alt being armed to the altitude, the cruise altitude, and now I'm green, meaning that now this is active. So mock alt cruise and nav are all active. All right. And if we look here, by the way, this needs to be on performance. We are at cruise. We are about 120. We'll wait a little while before we do the uh, uh, the destination information. So we'll give it a little time here and just enjoy. Let's take a look at the outside real quick. And beautiful terrain over France and Italy. I found it to be a lot more rewarding flying with a proper checklist and really going through all the details. And I hope that you guys also enjoyed, uh, you know, enjoyed this. And uh, please do let me know in chat if you want to see more of this. Does Tolus provide a similar in-depth experience? Lionheart, no, they do not. Good evening there, Thorsten. How are you doing? Dennis, welcome aboard, my friend. Um, so in terms of the simulation, I have found that Phoenix and the FS Labs are probably neck to neck in terms of the simulation. Although, from to be completely honest and completely unbiased, 
the FS Labs is a notch more in depth than the Phoenix, um, especially when it comes to things like the radios and things like that. Then definitely they have more, and they got all the cabin announcements also. Uh, there are a few things where the Phoenix has. So, for example, this button is not clickable in the FS Labs. It is clickable here, but uh, but yeah, the FS Labs guys is absolutely excellent in terms of the depth of system simulation. Um, so those two aircraft are neck to neck. The Tolus, although it has a lot of depth on the on the MCDU. But the rest of the aircraft systems are not as in-depth. So for example, remember what I showed you guys with the uh, accumulated pressure and the brake pressure and all that? That is not simulated on the Tolis. And I've done a test to check that and it's actually not simulated. Uh, so yes, more, okay, good stuff, good stuff. Thank you guys. Um, an amazing amount of information shared. Thanks for the experience along the way. Thank you very much, Stan, appreciate it, my friend. And good luck to you on your trip. Um, so it, it is definitely more rewarding, in my view, to fly, you know, with standard operating procedures. There were so many things that I used to uh, do incorrectly, and it was very enlightening uh, to, to learn all of these things. And more to come. And by the way, I'm doing also a series on the Boeing, but I want to finish the Airbus uh, sort of lessons first. And uh, once I'm through with the Airbus and can give you guys everything that I've learned, then I'm going to turn to the Boeing. And for the Boeing, by the for for the uh, I I can't wait for the IXEG 737 400 uh, to come out. Oh, was it a 300? I believe um, because it's just really a, an incredible aircraft. And uh, I do own a lot of the manuals from Captain Mike Ray which uh, he really puts out some invaluable resources uh, for how to operate these aircraft again from the perspective of the airline that he's worked for uh, in the past but his uh, manuals are absolutely amazing very very informative very easy to follow full of pictures he explains things uh, in a very nice way and if you guys by the way if you like me to create uh, a pdf document of the checklist and all the notes that I've created for this flight, I'm more than happy to do so. Just let me know in chat and I'll be uh, more than happy to uh, post it to maybe on uh, the channel or flightsim.to or somewhere there. Um, by the way, if you can, let me just uh, point your attention to something. If you look here, you'll see that this uh, fix or the airway is in white which means that we are able to do the altitude for this particular waypoint. If you see this in magenta, it means that there is a restriction or there is an altitude you need to be at and you're not going to be able to make it. So magenta, no good. White is good. Just remember that as you fly. All right. We can start entering the information into the uh, Mukdu. So let's go ahead and begin. We are about 86 nautical miles and the preparation for the Mukdu uh, follows again a certain, uh, certain sequence, okay? So the Mukdu preparation follows something called the top hat sequence. And the top hat sequence is flight plan, rad nav, progress, performance, fuel prediction, and then secondary flight plan, all right? So that's why it's called the top hat. All right, so just remember, again, when you do the Mukdu arrival preparation, you are going to follow the top path sequence. First, we are going to go to the, uh, we're going to go to the EFIS, by the way. We're going to set the EFIS on constraints, and we're going to turn on the landing system here on both sides. And then for the Mukdu preparation, we're going to follow, so first we're going to go to the flight plan. And uh, flight plan, we're just going to be noting the arrival runway here uh, uh, so everything here looks good we're looking at 1733 UTC for arrival and by the way uh, from the arrival time to the actual time so this is the actual time and we need to turn the seatbelt signs back on either at 10,000 feet or about 10 minutes before landing all right so next we're going to go to the rad nav again we haven't really done anything here so we don't need to enter anything here we'll just leave this as is 
We're going to the progress page, and now we need to enter the arrival runway here from the progress page. So we are arriving LI uh, PZ and uh, runway 22 left. So 22 left, and we enter that here. And now it gives us the distance and bearing to the runway, 66 degrees and destination dis distance to the runway is 133.6. All right, so we're done with flight plan. Again, top hat sequence, flight plan, rat nav, progress. Then we're gonna go to the performance page and we're gonna select the next phase, next phase, and ah, previous phase, all right. So from here, we're gonna enter the arrival information and for this, we can come to our EFB and we're just gonna go to my flight and we're gonna go to the next page and we're gonna select the arrival METAR at, uh, at uh, Venice, Italy. At 1905, the altimeter is 1013, which makes sense because uh, Venice is at sea level, so 1013 is set in the QNH, and the current temperature is uh, going to be 16 Celsius. So 16 is set. The wind is 195. So 1905. And we entered that here. Transition altitude is 6,000, and now we need to get the barrow. So we are going to go to uh, our uh, charts. All right, so let's go to runway 22 left, and we're going to select the approach. Uh, 22 left, that's the VOR runway that we're selecting here. So let's go and take a look. And the, what we need is a DA, all right, so 430. So we're gonna enter 430 in the barrow 430, and that is done. And next we're gonna go to fuel prediction. And as you remember, we said we need a minimum of 30 minutes on arrival. So we are okay there. We have the 30 minutes set here. The minimum destination flight on board is 2.8. Uh, and the uh, end uh, flight on board. So this is the minimum destination flight on board is 2.8. We're gonna arrive at, uh, at uh, Venice with 3.6. So we are good and that's more than sufficient and meeting the uh, fully the legal uh, requirements. All right, so uh, we are done here with the McDo arrival sequence and the only thing that we need to do is uh let me just take a quick note of uh, 430 all right <clears throat> so the only thing now we need to do is uh, begin our descent at the top of descent captain ray hello my friend welcome aboard i'm doing boy if you boo me i'm boo boo <laughs> how are you doing my friend uh, i hope you are okay captain ray QA, in your opinion, regardless of the simulator, is the Tolus A320 Neo or the Phoenix the better uh, the better aircraft? Ah, that's a really tough one. Um, so I think there are things. Uh, th first of all, the Phoenix is not a Neo aircraft, so it's it's different uh, than the Tolus. Um, uh, it, the depth of system simulation is very much very very close. Uh, there are a few things in the Phoenix uh, that are better simulated. Uh, I think not not the McDo, but the aircraft systems. I think, for example, the uh, brake pressure. Uh, you know, the uh, you can see here the. Uh, uh, you know, I, I showed again the avionics. Uh, you see here the blower. Uh, you know how these are all modeled, animated. So in that, in in those terms, I think the Phoenix Phoenix it kind of is a notch up, uh, but. Both are excellent uh, aircraft, uh, really uh, excellent. Quick reminder, guys, uh, that uh, the Q8 Pilot Channel is a platinum sponsor of FS Expo 2023 in Houston, Texas. And uh, if you are going to be there, 
uh, please come and say hello at booth H7. Uh, it should be uh, a lot of fun. We can see the top of descent now coming here. Again, uh, with the, everything with Airbus, every, when you see something in, uh, in blue, it means it is armed. And everything in green is active. All right, perfect. Let's take a look at the outside real quick. It looks like there's a lot of traffic here in the... <coughs> there we go. <coughs> You're most welcome, uh, Thorsten. Bill Barrett told us might have edge when it comes to failure. So, yeah. So, in terms of failures, I think that's where the Tolis uh, really excels. Uh, really, really good. I, I love Tolis. I love the lineup by Tolis, and my absolute favorite is the A320neo. Uh, just outstanding uh, aircraft, really. And, uh, yeah, the failures is, uh, is very, very well done on much, much better than the, uh, much better than the Phoenix uh, and the FS Labs. Uh, so that's an area where it really, really excels. So uh, if you want to, so if you want to follow like, uh, you know, if you want to see the animations and you want to follow, you know, SOPs uh, without failures, I recommend the Phoenix. If you want to really fly, you know, at training missions, uh, you know, like real world training, if you want to train on certain situations like fire, engine fire, APU failure, you know, things like that, I definitely recommend the Tolis uh, A320. Uh, that would be my, uh, you know, my recommendation. Both are great, but they can be used for different things. All right, so the only two checklists that are remaining now is the approach checklist and the landing checklist. And I will leave the shutdown and the secure and all that stuff for another stream, just in the interest of time. So today we'll do those and land. Um, but yeah, I hope that uh, this has been, uh, you know, uh, something different from what I normally do on streams. And I know that it takes a lot more time uh, to do this uh, than to do the regular streams but I hope that it's been useful for you guys and that you've learned something new uh, during the stream all right so we can now monitor our time our flight time so far has been 28 minutes the time since engine start has been 50 minutes and if you look here uh, by the way I need to put this back on preference all right uh, let me increase this a little bit. Ah, we can see the restrictions now. Yay. All right. So we'll, we'll take a closer look. You'll, you'll be able to see the restrictions once we are there. But if we look here, 733, uh, so about 30 minutes until we arrive into, uh, fl uh, into Venice, Italy. Uh, here's the top of descent. We're doing a VOR 22 left today. I'm not sure if we're going to need the LS landing system, uh, but it has uh, put the frequency for the VOR there. Just look at this beautiful terrain, guys. Lovely. I'm really, by the way, happy with... Uh, you know, with the RTX 4090. And by the way, if you ask me, is it, you know, is it worth it? Um, I would say that it's probably not worth it if, you know, you're just going to use it for Microsoft Flight Simulator, to be very honest. The, the FPS per dollar value is going to be very, very high. So, uh, yeah, I mean... It's, it's a, an expensive card, but I'm quite happy with it. I'm, I'm happy with the investment I made. And, and then, of course, I did it because I want to show you guys what this card does. And then give you my opinion so that you guys don't go and waste your money. But I think with Microsoft Flight Simulator, to be completely honest with you guys, you can reduce the 
settings to a point where the visual fidelity is not affected and you still get very good performance. All right, so we're gonna go to, uh, let's set the MCP altitude. We forgot to do that, I believe. Uh, if we go here, so 2000, all right, so let's go to 2000, all right. And we're almost there at the top of descent, two nautical miles. And there is something I wanna tell you now. All right, so distance one, all right, we can begin the descent and we're gonna do a nav descent. All right, now you can see again here on the FMA, the boxes are coming, saying, all right, thrust is idle, I've changed something. Again, it's telling you, uh, I've changed something, it needs more drag, and then it goes away. All right, so we're just gonna give it a little more, a little more drag uh, so that it can reduce the speed. Now, one thing, uh, we're gonna begin the approach checklist in a minute, but uh, <coughs> I've lost what I was gonna tell you guys. Ah, so the difference between open descent and nav descent. When you say open descent, none of the restrictions will be respected. So let's say that you set this to 2000 and there is a restriction on 5000 and you have this on open descent, it will not respect that constraint, okay? The descent, nav descent, when you're in nav descent, it will respect, even if you put this at 2000 or 1000 and there is a restriction at 5000, the Airbus is going to respect that and will hold the altitude at that specific. Now we can start seeing the restrictions here because we have the constraints. So now we can start seeing the constraints there and boom. And uh, there we go. All right. So looking good. And uh, we continue now the uh, descent and it's a good time now to do the approach, uh, approach checklist. Approach checklist is very simple. Minima is 430 set, engine mode selector, normal, and the approach checklist is complete. All right. Then of course we have the uh, before uh, landing uh, flows and checklist, which we will perform as we get closer. But now folks, you can start seeing the, let me show you here. So now you can start seeing the restrictions, 270 knots, and you need to be, so the first restriction here at Albert is we need to be above 10,000 and below 13,000. So the McDo is gonna take care of that for us. Uh, again, very, very useful to have the, uh, uh, the constraints there. And it's actually useful to have it on all the time. Thank you very much there, Mexhiti Pilot. How are you doing, my friend? Q8, I'm so pleased you did this. This is uh, this is absolute old-time favorite aircraft. Well, thank you very much, Dougal. I appreciate it. I'm glad you enjoyed it. Custom 08, been an extremely valuable stream. Thanks. Thank you very much, sir. Appreciate it. Thank you. I'm glad you guys found it useful, and uh, hopefully more to come. Uh, by the way, we can have the terrain ND on the first officer's side and the weather radar there. Now, in some situations where, uh, you know, where the clear, skies are clear, they can actually both go to the terrain uh, or can go both to weather depending on the... So there isn't really a rule, uh, but uh, yeah. Uh, one thing also is uh, kind of a funny, funny thing. You see this here, recorder, it says CVR erase, all right? Now, if you, if you erase this in real life, it will erase all the data that is in, that all, everything that went on between you and the first officer before engine start. And that information is actually sent through the A cars to the airline. And if you do that, you will immediately put, be put on suspension. So you will be on the no-fly list until this matter is investigated. So whatever you do, uh, don't click that CVR erase button. Yeah, it's really gonna flag it with the airline. All right, let me just see real quick. What are we getting in terms of FPS right now? 55, 56 SP. You know, guys, 
We're getting about 57 F to 56 FPS. And the strange thing is, it's all taken by OBS. Without F OBS, I'm, I get like 75. Uh, but we might also be having a lot of traffic from FSLTL. But it's okay. Not a big deal. All right, now, folks, you can see all the restrictions here. You can see we have a bunch of restrictions, altitudes, speeds, everything. If I switch here this to plan, how come we don't see the plan? Today, I tell you guys, it's doing some strange things today. Because if we switch to plan, we get nothing. Let me check our flight plan real quick. Yeah, flight plan is good. Now you can see all the constraints there, 230 knots, 210 knots, all that good stuff. All right, there's one thing um, we didn't do, which I will do now. And it's going to help us. And then again, it's part of the part of the McDo preparation. Uh, but here's here's what we're going to do. We're going to come back to the flight plan. Uh, and this is bit. By the way, we should have done this in the top hat sequence. Remember, when we go to the flight plan, what we need to do is set up the ring around the arrival. So it's okay. And to do this, you always go to the very first waypoint here that appears in your display. So we are at Albert, but we're going to use this one. And we're going to use fix information. We're going to put the reference fix, which is uh, LIPZ22 left, LIPZ22 left. And we're going to enter it, and we're going to add seven nautical miles. Now, this is it's going to draw a circle, and that is that circle is going to be the circle you can see it, it's beginning to appear here. Once we are at seven nautical miles from the runway, that's when we're going to select flaps uh, three and flaps full. So again, it is used for situational awareness, and it's done as part of the uh, uh, Makdu preparation, uh, normally in the very first step following the top hat sequence. So, uh, so yeah, so now we have the little circle there around the arrival. And we are good. Almost there. Uh, can you simulate emergencies like engine failure and fires in the Phoenix? Yes, you can. But in uh, so if you if you go back to the Tolus uh, in, in X-Plane, generally you'll actually see the fire. But yeah, you can definitely simulate uh, engine fire here. If you go actually here to the failures. Um, let me do guys one thing. I'm gonna go ahead and turn this off. All right, because I don't want any aircraft on the uh, on the arrival. All right, so all right. So if you go here to the McDo, and we go to the MCD menu, and you go to config, uh, then you see here there are failures, and you can start selecting failures. So there's manual failures, random failures. So you can select here and simulate the failure that you want. We'll keep this on performance. All right. And I'm going to remove this here. It's, you know what? Let's put this on the first officer's side so we have it. And then we can see here things clearly. All right. So let me zoom in here. Now you can see the constraints here properly. Uh, a button that I probably used very seldom in my previous uh, experience with the Airbus. But uh, it's been very enlightening for me. Uh, the past few days uh, and just you can see now all the restrictions there and uh, yeah excellent right speed is coming down as you can see here as we uh, as we get closer to 10,000 feet and but we're gonna leave everything to the McDo so we'll let the McDo manage everything for us today I will leave this on descent this is good and now we know exactly when we're going to begin retracting, uh, uh, deploying the flaps. And I'll remember, I'll try to remember to show you that when you set flaps one, you actually only deploy the spoilers and not 
the, the, the flaps are, do not actually go to position one when you are up in the air. So far, 40 minutes in our flight. It's been an enjoyable stream thus far. And uh, really enjoyed the interaction with you guys. I know I've done very little of it today. Uh, so my apologies for that. But I hope that uh, I was able to deliver maximum benefit for you guys. All right here's uh, again the beautiful terrain over Italian airspace. Just lovely. Just look at that. That's just beautiful. By the way, folks, uh, there is a, uh, a new aircraft, a new ultra-light aircraft that has been released by Orbex in collaboration with Blackwing, a Swedish company, which I will be reviewing. And uh, I know a lot of you guys have been asking me about X-Enviro. X-Enviro version 1.2 has been released for, uh, for X-Plane 12. And uh, at this point, um, it's just in terms of performance, it's, it's not good. It's really not good. So it looks okay. It looks good. But the performance is, is terrible. All right. I'm going to switch this to about 20. And we're approaching 10,000 feet now. So we can turn on the lights. And we can also turn on the fasten seatbelt sign. If we look here at the flight plan, all right. So we've got 1733. We are at 1712. So that's a good time to turn on the landing lights. And fasten seatbelt sign goes on. The uh, visibility is very good. So, uh, by the way, runway 04. Uh, <clears throat> runway 04 left at uh, at Venice is uh, is actually parallel to is on the same uh, the, the same direction as runway 22 left so right that's our turn we're below 10,000 feet we're looking good Alrighty. Just look at how beautiful the view from the passenger window there. Again, nice details on the passenger window. Volatia. <laughs> and back in the cockpit, all is looking good. And as you can see now, um, the Mukdu, the autopilot, is going to respect all the restrictions because we are in nav descent or descent nav. If we go to open descent, then it would just go to 2,000 feet and will not respect any of the uh, set constraints here. Very lovely uh, terrain over uh, Italy. Beautiful country, beautiful people, succulent food. Very, very nice. Yeah. All right. So we've done the approach checklist. So the only thing remaining, uh, according to my notes, is the landing checklist today. 
Now the check, the the land. There are flows that we're going to do for the for the landing, but for the uh, uh, the landing checklist is just cabin secure for landing, auto throttle speed, uh, go around altitude is set, and ecam memo landing no blue. That would be the landing checklist. All right. So we're we're going to worry about that in just a minute, and we're going to switch to uh, manual speed and sets the speed to 180 knots just in a little while right here so once we see this you see this is the d cell sign that's when we're gonna set it and one of the nice things about the airbus autopilot is that even if it, if it once reduce if you set the speed uh, you know to a speed that is not corresponding to the correct flap level it will not do it as you can see here so it will just stay at two. This is correct now, 210. Uh, but it will not change that. It, it, even if we set this to a lower speed and the flap setting isn't done right, it will not do that. All right, so we're going back to 10 now. And now we can see things clearly. Jafar, hello Q8, you are convincing me to try MSFS. <laughs> In Spanish, that means fly around. Oh, is it really, Carl? Oh, thanks for that. Easy and cheap to try out using the Game Pass. Yeah, for sure. It's kind of like the Spanish version of Southwest Airlines. I see. All right. Here's our turn towards Venice, the city of love. All right, we're at eight thousand. By the way, transition altitude is at six thousand. So this, by the way, indicates when the aircraft is going to begin descending again. And the final cruise, so 6,000 feet to clear. And 210 knots is a restriction there. So we're going to keep it there at 210 until we pass this point here. Now you see this dot, the green dot, you see it's moving down and once it starts coming to the center you'll see that the aircraft will begin the descent again. A little bit of uh, clouds there uh, ahead of us. Now, I'm not sure if we can use the approach this app nav, so that is activated now. And we're gonna come here to the overhead panel. We are now going to turn on the runway turn off lights and the taxi to take off. We're gonna come down here and set the auto brake to low, arm the speed brakes, and we are now ready to configure the aircraft for our arrival. You can see that we've begun the descent again. It says Alt Final. Again, you can see this in blue. That means that it knows that the final uh, an initial approach altitude is 2,000 feet and it's armed it, but it's not yet active. Okay, all right. We're gonna continue the descent. And what I'm gonna do is after this restriction, uh, once we pass this restriction, we're going to set the speed to 180 until we reach our little circle uh, on the on the display, and that's when we're going to switch back to manage speed. So once we pass this restriction, we're still at 210 knots, so we're going to leave it for the time being, and I can see the airport ahead of us now.
if we go to 2040, that's the airport right there. All right, we can begin. We can now see the ring here uh, ahead of us. So uh, what we're gonna do, <coughs> what we're gonna do now is uh, we are going to reduce the speed. To uh, that's okay. There's one restriction there, so I'm gonna start reducing our speed to 180 knots. Right, 180 is set. And now I'm gonna show you. Uh, so we're going here, we're below the green dot, speed check, flaps 1. Alright, so now that we've done flaps 1, check what happens in the back. You can see there's no flaps, right? But if you go to, uh, if you go to, uh, uh, let's see here, number, where we go? Hang on, 9 is here. Zero. All right. You can see the slats are deployed, but not the flaps, right? So that's the first configuration there, and uh, we continue the descent. We're going to keep it at 180 until we reach the 7 nautical mile ring from the runway, and we're going to keep it at 180, flaps 1, and we continue the descent. All right, 6,000, so we're gonna set the barrow to 1013. Come on, 1013 and almost at our destination. Now, guys, what we're going to do is we are going to... I can see the runway ahead of us. And we have about 24 nautical miles. At this point, what I'm going to do is I'm going to go to manage speed. But what I'm going to say is activate the approach. And the reason you see this is because we have this approach. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to disconnect the autopilot. And my aircraft. And we're going to begin the descent.
Let's go to... Hang on. Let's slow down. Right. So like gear down. All right, set my view. Right, we're looking good. A little bit of, uh, you know, discoordinated uh, thing. I kind of caught me off guard there, but that's all right. All right, so the landing checklist: uh, cabin is secure, auto throttle speed one thousand, go around altitude is set, ecam memo. Landing no blue, I suppose. There is one blue, which we need to... There we go. <laughs> yeah, I need to practice on my VOR approaches. But uh, that's okay. Two whites, two reds. Minimum. Continue. One hundred. Fifty, forty. We came on 30, the wrong runway, by the way. Twenty. Retard. Five. We landed on zero four right instead of uh, zero uh, twenty two left, but that's all right. Right, reverse screen, decel. That's the wrong runway that we've landed on. But nonetheless, we've made it okay. Hopefully, better uh, better coordination uh, there at uh, that. That's actually the part that I did not review very well before the you know before this flight today. But that's okay. All right to taxi. Runway turn off lights goes to the off position. The strobes, by the way, should have been on the on, but they're on auto. That's okay. And nav lights can stay where they are. And now the T casts can go back to standby. And there we go. The replay wasn't on, unfortunately. They will give you the number to call. <laughs> All right. Welcome to Venice, Italy, ladies and gentlemen. And despite the... Uh, despite, I think, the... Uh, the final errors on landing. Uh, overall, I think it was uh, very enjoyable uh, really flying with the checklists. And uh, at this point, by the way, we can start the APU 1001, 1002, 1003, start. <laughs> Yeah, no worries at all. No worries at all. 
Thank you very much, Stan. Yeah, I, I echo that. Uh, it's just really a lot of fun uh, to, uh, to fly with Real World Checklist and just the sheer knowledge uh, that you get from, you know, the material that's out there is, is a lot of fun. It, and again, by the way, guys, what's very important to know is that normally there are two people doing all these things. So in our case today, there's only myself. I would love to do this flight uh, or a similar flight with uh, somebody like V1. Uh, it would be just really interesting to do the flight with him. And, uh, you know, having, uh, you know, a captain and a first officer, it, it would be just really uh, incredible fun to do that. And uh, yeah, he told me he, he would do it someday. So maybe I need to reach out to him and maybe do, uh, like a flight, uh, like a shared cockpit or something on Discord, something like that. Uh, should be good fun. But uh, yeah, normally everything we've done today is done by two, uh, two pilots. Uh, unfortunately, though, because it's the sim, then, you know, there's only one person doing it. But uh, it was definitely a lot of fun. I really enjoyed it. All right, here we come to the parking position. All right, and parking brake is set. And now we can come here and turn on the APU bleed. Uh, by the way, we should turn off the taxi light before we arrive into the position. And this goes to the off position. The transponder goes to standby. And we can now turn off the engines. Engine 2, engine 1. All right, and we wait for 10%. We can now turn off the beacon lights. And you can see the jetway automatically coming to the aircraft. Looks like external power is available, so we're going to turn the external power. We're going to remove the APU bleed. Again, uh, if you recall, we said that if the external power is available, we can leave the APU on without the bleed, and that will consume less fuel and uh, still supply cold air uh, to the cabin. All right. There we go. Excellent. And we can now release the fasten seat belt and non-smoking signs and we can begin deboarding so let's go to GSX request the deboarding, deboarding. alright So, I hope you guys enjoyed this. Uh, you're most welcome. And uh, Passengers, the boarding started. enjoy the flight as well, Captain. Thank you. Thank you very much, Pip. I uh, appreciate it. Uh, thank you very much, guys, for your kind words. I'm glad that you uh, enjoyed it. Uh, don't forget your phone and stuff. Yep, yep, absolutely. Um, All right, so the passengers are now deboarding the aircraft, as you can see here. By the way, we can actually come here. You guys will be able to see them. There we go. They're kind of taking their own sweet time, and this guy at least seems like he's delaying everyone. But uh, yeah, this is this is pretty much, guys, what I wanted to share with you in this uh, in this live stream. I definitely hope that this was uh, an insightful, useful. Uh, sort of, uh, you know, Q8 pilot tutorial type flight. Uh, I know we messed up right at the very end because I am probably not very proficient in flying a VOR approach. I need to brush up on that. Uh, the, again, the, one, one of the things we did wrong is LS is not normally used when you're doing an RNAV or a VOR approach, but I completely forgot. Uh, so again, a lot of things still committed to memory. And I probably still have a lot of bad habits that I need to undo uh, after learning all these things about Airbus 
in the last uh, few days. So, uh, so, but I hope that overall this was a useful, uh, you know, useful uh, stream. I want to thank you again all for being here this evening. Until next time, please take care of yourselves and each other, and I will see you all very soon. Thanks for tuning in, stay safe, and bye-bye for now.